It's the UA is the EKG for a nephrology. So make sure you always um, you always do you always do report the UA. The UA the UA um, is an automated test, um, and typically when the counter picks up any abnormalities, that's when one of the technicians they go in and they look at the urine sediment. The way they do it is not the 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 proper way. It's just a pretty superficial and sometimes inaccurate uh, report. Um, the, the correct way of doing it is actually taking a urine sample. Uh, you do like a, a clean catch, like a midstream urine, and you um, spin the urine for 10 minutes. Um, you get rid of the, the you know, super natant, and you get the sediment and you put it in a slide. You don't need to do any staining. You just basically, uh, you will be able to see the cast, most of the cast, like the, the waxy cast, uh, I'm sorry, one of the, the, the very, um, the lipid cast, is, it may, you may not be able to see it without any staining, but, but the vast majority of cast you will be able to see it. So that's the correct way of doing a um, urine sedimentation test. Do you do it on everyone? Well, if you're doing a nephrology rotation, you're going to be expected to do that. In clinical practice, you don't have the time to do that. Uh, but I personally do it every time I'm confronted with a case where I don't know what's going on. And uh, we're going to learn today about uh, um, um, how to approach a patient with acute kidney injury. Because that's, that's, if you guys end up in the uh, inpatient setting, that's what you're going to see all the time. And sometimes in the outpatient setting, you're confronted with uh, this, this, the same question. And you need to make decisions about whether or not should I admit this patient or should, should I just manage him as an outpatient. I'm just uh, Miguel David. Just pull it up. <coughs> okay. This is where the sent folder. Oh, yes, sorry. Okay, no problem. I sent it to Ramiro before I came, but he didn't print it. Okay. Carnitine? Clonidine. I do it in the hypertensive uh, urgency patient, and I do it for those that are actually really intolerant to any other medications, especially in the setting of kidney disease. Your options are very limited because you can't really use thiazide when the GFR is less than 30. Um, you can't really use. Um, 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 a lot of the times patients become very hyperkalemic and ASARB become, become an issue. I try not to, you know, I, I do a lot of education about patients about uh, potassium, high potassium foods, uh, but sometimes it's necessary and I do use it, but I always give the same talk to every patient about compliance. If they miss doses, they can, they can have rebound hypertension. And that's the problem with uh, clonidine because it's a short acting medication and you need to use it at least three times a day. Um, and also I do, I do use it with caution in those patients that are already beta blocked because of the risk of additive bradycardia and, and AV nodal blockade. So just make sure that you, you guys know that if you, if you prescribe it, make sure you're following the heart rate. Um, and sometimes the patients do have side effects, the dry mouth, you know, the, you know, sometimes they feel like, like uh, dizzy headaches, but the dry mouth is probably the, the most common side effect from cloning. But I do use it. I prefer, I prefer not to, but in the field that I am, um, your options are very limited when, when the patients have advanced kidney disease, and sometimes you have to use it. You're going to see dialysis patients on clonidine all the time. And what about uh, patches? I prefer the patch, to be honest with you. I prefer the patch because um, non-compliance is, is a big issue in clinical practice. Uh, and the clonidine patch, patch is a sustained release. You replace it once a week. Uh, it comes in 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3 micrograms. If you're tapering, uh, you, need to, you need to make sure that you switch them to pills, an equivalent dose of pills, and, uh, and you start doing a, a, a slow taper. The, but the patch is usually well tolerated. Very rarely the patients develop like a contact dermatitis, and that, that may be an issue for some patients, but, but I prefer the patch. If I'm going to keep somebody on, on, on a regular regimen of clonidine, I prefer the patch. It is, yeah. It definitely is, yeah. And um, less side effects? It's, it's, just, it's just the fact that you have it continuously and the patients don't have to worry about like 
Like, like the problem that I have with Kanye is they, they all forget to take it at one time and they, be, they become very hypertensive. And those spikes in hypertension, they can be dangerous. And what's the max dose of Kanye? 0 0.3 mics three times a day. So obviously you can't reach that. Really. With the patch you can't reach that, yeah. But you can do, you can do uh, PRN clonidin. Let's say your patient is already on 0 0.3 and you can just do PRN 0.1 as needed, systolic blood pressure greater than 160 or whatever. What yeah. would you say most of your usage of clonidine is inpatient? Or For the... For clonidine use? No, not rarely. It's rarely used inpatient. They use it in the ER and they use it in the, in the urgent care because it's a medication you don't need to have labs for. Uh, but inpatient, we, most of the doctors inpatient, they start using like a lot of the IV beta blockers and IV hydralazine. Like medications that they use inpatient are mostly those two, like Lavetolol or Esmolol and hydralazine, IV hydralazine. And when the patients are pretty hypertensive, they put them on a nitro, like a, a nitro drip, or, or you give them, um, yeah, because the, the other ones are not really injectable, you know, like. What don't you like about IV? What's that? What don't you like about IV? Well, he, well, if you, it, it, we have nitroglycerin and we have nitroprosite. Nitroprosite is, is indicated in the setting of like, like a, you know, like dissection or like severe hypertensive emergency. You have to be cautious about uh, in advanced kidney disease because it can be metabolized to, to I think it's uh, arsenic. Uh, one of the metabolites, so you can't really use it in, in advanced kidney disease, you can't really use it. I, 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 I do like nitrous a lot, I think, uh, but in patient, nitroproside, we do it mostly for hypertensive emergencies. But how long can you use it? Oh, you can use it you know, for as long as the patient is in the ICU. I mean, you know, they, like that, the, the toxicity becomes an issue, like as long as you, you stay on it, but you know, seven days I think is prudent. Yeah, seven days is, is safe to, to use it. Like beyond that, you can start like, like reading, like getting into risk of accumulation. Yeah. One of the problems with IV nitro is, especially in heart failure patients, is you're giving a lot of fluid, so you can double, triple, quadruple concentrate. Right. It's, you know, on IV nitro drips, especially high dose, you end up giving liters and liters. Of right. So that's a, that's a issue in clinical practice when you're trying to diary someone. Like you need to concentrate all IV fluids and drips, but drips definitely, if you, if you have an oral route, it's preferred. Like in other words, oral is always preferred uh, for the hospitalized patient that they can still eat and drink. Uh, but if the patients are very sick and they're in the ICU intubated, you know, we use, we use drips. How much yeah. do you use Lavetolol? Lavetolol inpatient? No, oral. Oral, I mean, you can go up. Lavetolol is one of those doses that like nobody really knows how much is the maximum dose. I've seen patients on 400 TID. You know, you can start, like a, I think the pills come in 100 and 200. Um, you can start as low as 50 BID, 100 BID, but you can go safely, you can go up. Um, some doctors don't like it because they feel it's like weak, it's a weak uh, antihypertensive medicine, but it's great, like, like I like it. And I use it for, in pregnancy, we use it a lot. So it's, it's a good medication in, in the setting of hypertension in pregnancy. So it's a beta and an alpha. Beta and alpha, and yeah. Antagonist. Yeah. Can't see a lot of the alpha? No, like no. Right. I mean, you can. If you were to measure, probably you you probably would see it. But you know, remember, in orthostatic, we 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 make decisions based on symptoms primarily. So if the patients are having symptoms, definitely an issue. But you know, like most patients taking an alpha blocker will have some degree of orthostatic hypotension. Yeah, but I in in going back to your question about nitrates, we use it we use them a lot. I use them a lot in renal disease because, like I said, the the options are very limited. So like the short acting nitrates that the cardiologists, they love to use is TID. Again, the issue is the compliance, but I, I mostly use the isosorbide, the, the, the nitrate, the Indoor, and uh, the maximum dose on that one is 90 milligrams twice a day, and you can, we, you can up titrate. It doesn't really have any metabolic side effects, and it's a medication that you can, you can easily up titrate, and, and it's safe. What's the major problem with nitrates now? Headaches. No, I don't, think, I don't think there's headaches, patients complain of headaches, but yeah, tachyphylaxis, yeah. But, but it's a safe medication. From the renal perspective, we love it because it doesn't have any metabolic effects, not like the other ones. And um, what are the other questions I want to ask you? Um, oh, um, orthostatic, severe orthostatic hypertension. What do you tend to follow? Let's say somebody's buffers are lying down as 150 and standing up as 90. 
how are you going to... The standing readings. Yeah, so if you review the, the topic on orthostatic um, hypotension, um, there's a lot of things that you need to have like con in consideration. So number one, most patients with advanced age are going to have some degree of autonomic dysfunction. Then, then we have the other groups that are at risk for autonomic dysfunction. We have the patients with uh, diabetes, we have the patient with Parkinson-like syndromes, um, and we have the patients that uh, just because you're old and you're, having, you're exhibiting some, some side of uh, um, autonomic dysfunction. Then we have the big category which are the medications, and a lot of the medications are actually responsible for orthostasis, um, primarily blood pressure medicines, but we also see medications like SSRIs are actually big, big in that category. Um, we also have um, 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 tricyclic antidepressants can also exacerbate orthostatic hypotension. Uh, and then we have like the notorious one that we know, diuretics, alpha blockers, um, uh, let me think what else. Yeah, so... Have you seen it with Soma or don't use Soma? Soma, Soma, I'm not sure. Yeah, Soma, Soma, there's a lot of like bad, bad, bad things about Soma because um, you know, it, it can create a lot of like uh, habit forming. It's a habit forming medicine, and and in the el elderly, it's a bad medication to use because patients can get very confused, and, and it can also build up. Uh, you know, soma is one of those those drugs that it's this is re is red flagged in the geriatric population. So make sure you guys don't use it in the elderly. Um, uh, but I don't know. I'm not sure if it. You know, some of the muscle relaxers can cause it, but I'm not sure if soma does. So. Things that you have to have in mind is like, you not always have to change the medicine unless the patients are symptomatic. If the patient is very high risk for falling, it's very prudent to do that. But one, some of the strategies you can recommend your patients is to use compression stockings. You can tell your patients to, um, to, to actually to cross the legs when they're standing, just to, you know, to avoid uh, venous return. I'm sorry, to improve venous return. Um, other, other things that they do is the, um, you know, we don't, we don't advise patients to increase sodium intake because most of these patients have an issue with hypertension, but if the patient doesn't have an issue with hypertension, maybe liberalizing sodium intake a little bit. Um, and those are primarily the things, like the compression stocking is a big recommendation for these patients. And educating them, you know, fall prevention and you know, just having a bedside commode, referring them to physical therapy to, to get like gait assisting devices and things like that. But it's a big problem, yeah. Here we follow the lower yeah. Yeah, I do follow the low. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if there's an arm discrepancy, we follow the higher. The higher. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds sounds reasonable. And the arm discrepancy can be related to some peripheral vascular disease, but you know we we do see that in clinical practice as well all the time. Yeah. What I do is in my practice, I do I do I always do two readings. I should probably do both arms, but I do two readings in one arm. And then I usually take uh, the second reading, uh, you know, because there's a lot of uh, anxiety when you're checking blood pressure for the first time with the patients. Okay. All right. So, you guys, this is not big enough, right? It's very small, right? Yeah. Um, Let me yeah, increase the. Bottom right. Oh, this if one? You, yeah. Press the plus sign. Yeah, pull that up. Okay. Okay. So these 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 cases I wrote um, back in when I was doing like uh, supervising nephrology students. I'm sorry, medical students. So this is like a doctrine series. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to make it as interactive as possible because I think that's probably the most effective way of like, teaching. Like when you when you involve the students and when you use clinical cases. Because there's nothing more boring than sitting down to a content review and, mm -hmm. and you don't make it interactive. So we're going to try to make it interactive, just interrupt and try to participate as much as you can. So I'm going to ask you to just please go ahead and read the first paragraph. Okay. This is a case in renal failure, acute renal. We don't call it renal failure anymore, right? How do we call it? Kidney injury. You guys know why? Because most of the times the kidney don't fail, number one, you know, and number two, it's a very intimidating word for the patients and the families. You know, you, you listen to like renal failure, wow, just think my kidneys gave up. So, yeah, we don't, we don't call it that way, but ICD-9 is still called it acute renal failure. Uh, but for your documentation, and, and we should call it acute kidney injury. Okay? Go ahead, just start reading now. You are requested to see an 80-year-old man on the 
peaceful service because of an elevated BUN and creatinine. He had just undergone a splenectomy for thrombocytopenia secondary to splenomegaly from underlying chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Immediately before surgery, his BUN was 22 mg per deciliter, creatinine was 1.3, urinalysis was normal. When checked two days postoperatively, his BUN has increased to 40 mg per deciliter and creatinine was 3.0. Mm -hmm. Urine output for, uh, for each of the last two days was approximately 250 mg per day. Given the above information, how would you characterize this patient's kidney problem? Oh, we can stop there. So. To summarize, we have an elderly person that went in for um, um, some splenectomy, which is an elective surgery, and then we know that his creatinine was 1.3. Is that a very abnormal creatinine for an 80-year-old male? Probably not, right? It's probably a little bit high. You know, the National Kidney Foundation came up with this classification of uh, kidney disease, dividing kidney disease in five stages from one to five, stage one being the less severe, stage five being the most severe. That was done about 15 years ago. And part of the reason why they did it was to raise the uh, attention of non-nephrology providers to refer the patients on a timely fashion when, you know, when the patients were rapidly decreasing. It's, it's, it's easier for everyone visually and for patients and, and providers to visually see if the percentage is dropping. Um, that way, that created a lot of like utilization of nephrology. Um, however, one of the problems that they created with this classification is that they actually ended up labeling patients with a disease that they actually didn't have. So all the time I get consults where the patients have a very stable GFR, let's say the GFR is 65, they have a very bland urine sediment, and when you look at the historical values, they're all pretty much the same. So that's reassuring. So in nephrology, there's two things that you look for. You Number one, if, if available, you look at the historical trends on the creatinine and number two you look at the urine sediment so if the urine sediment is bland and the, and the historical values are pretty pretty consistent with the same we don't worry about it and we reassure the patients because this classification creates a lot of like anxiety because most of the doctors they add like chronic kidney disease is stage three and the patient well nobody told me about chronic kidney disease and remember kidney disease is a silent process same as diabetes same as hypertension so that's the reason why primarily National Kidney Foundation came up with that classification, but 1.3 is probably normal for this individual. But what's interesting about this presentation is that this guy had the surgery, and two days after the, the, the surgery, his BUN doubled, right? He went up from, how much did I write? 22, he went up to 40, and the creatinine almost tripled, right? So. And the urine output was 250 mL per day. Is that a lot of urine output? That's a little bit of urine output? What do you guys think? Very little. So what is the normal urine output for an adult? I'm sorry? Is it 750? It's usually one mL per kilogram per day. So that's probably the quick and dirty way. Uh, depends on your fluid intake. The kidneys concentrate on dilute, depending on what we need. If we go to sleep, the kidneys concentrate. If we um, wake up and we're drinking a lot of water, the kidneys dilute. And that's normal renal function. So having a normal urine output range, it depends on how much you drink, but the textbook definition, in some textbook says 0.5. I probably prefer that we, we call it like one ml per kilogram. So it's um, uh, per hour. So that's, yeah, one ml per kilogram per hour. So that's usually in the ICU, in the critically ill patient, when they call you to see a consult, the nurses are gonna report, hey doctor, your patient was peeing, you know, 100 cc's an hour, and now we're down to 20 mLs in the last three hours. That's, that's pretty concerning, you know. And that's one of the problems that we have in nephrology, unlike cardiology. Cardiology have a lot of markers that are real-time markers as ischemia is happening, as ischemia or damage to the heart tissue is happening. In nephrology, we don't have such markers. You know, we're stuck with the same kind of measurement for the last 40 years, and we haven't been able to reliably um, uh, reproduce a, an assay that is, is apl ap applicable to every single patient. Um, they've, historically, they've come up with different markers, like cystatin, you know, there's new markers that are like uh, in the experimental phase. But right now we work with creatinine. That's all we have. And you guys remember from physiology that creatinine is, good, is a good surrogate marker of renal function because it's freely filtered, it's minimally secreted by the proximal tubule, and it's not reabsorbed. So 
you know, and if you're having a steady diet, if you're having a steady diet, you're producing the amount, the same amount of creatinine every day. And when you're presenting a case to one of your attendants, when you, you know, once, once conditions, once production and, and excretion of creatinine is changing rapidly in the setting of acute kidney injury, telling your doc, telling your attending like his GFR is down to 15, that's irrelevant because remember the GFR calculation was was uh, was derived of the um, of some studies that were done in the late 1990s. Have you guys heard about the MDRD equation, the modified disease in renal modified diet in renal disease study? So that's how they came up with the GFR you know equations, and those equations were done in primarily predominantly in a white population like middle-aged white males. And that's one of the criticisms of the MDRD equation is that it didn't really include a lot of different races and, um, and it also is not reproducible in the setting of acute kidney injury. So when you have acute kidney injury, you need to tell your attending his cranium is 1.3 yesterday, today is 1.8. The GFR is irrelevant at that point. But remember, GFR is for the outpatient setting, it's a classification and we use it for follow-up, outpatient follow-up. We don't do it for acute kidney injury um, follow-up. Okay, so um, you guys remember about BUN, right? Okay, so do you know what causes a high BUN? I just want to hear like, like, like a few examples. What what gives you a high BUN? And the the purpose of this question is when you when you go home, you're gonna know that not only kidney disease can cause a high BUN. Always think about that. Okay, so what what causes high BUN? You guys remember? I'm sorry. If you're, you said cancer, if you have a high catabolic state, there's a lot of cell turnover like in cancer, or burn victims, or trauma victims, or patients that are very sick, like if you like, take a look at the labs, they're very catabolic and there is a lot of BUN, that's correct. So that's, that's one of the scenarios. What other scenarios you, you get a lot of BUN? Well, renal failure, yeah, it gives you a high BUN. But remember, patients, cirrhotic patients, they usually tend to have a very low BUN because they really have very little protein, very little muscle mass. I'm sorry, what? Obstruction. Obstruction, like renal obstruction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so any process causing renal failure, either it's pre-renal, intrinsic renal, or post-obstructive, can give you a high BUN. But um, what else? You guys remember. So pre-renal. Remember, if you're very dry, remember that, you know, FINA, I'm, I'm not a big fan of FINA, and believe it or not, nephrologists, we don't use FINA, they, they teach you this in medical school, but FINA can be falsely positive in many settings, but uh, remember, the higher the BUN, the more likely that you're dealing with perlinal azotemia. Uh, so any, any type of scenario like, like nausea, vomiting, bleeding, GI losses, things like that. Um, what else? There's one that is in clinic, it has a lot of clinical relevance. If you, if you work, if you do inpatient uh, medicine, if you do inpatient internal medicine, if you see a high BUN, you have to suspect a gastrointestinal bleed. So always remember that. When you're admitting a patient, if you suspect bleed, look at the BUN, BUN is out of proportion to the creatinine. Think about uh, gastrointestinal bleed. So there are other scenarios where the BUN can be very high. Uh, for instance, patients that are getting amino acid diets, like uh, TPN, um, they, they, they have very high BUNs. And also patients that are getting steroids, steroids, IV steroids, invariably you see the BUN pre-high dose steroids and post-high dose steroids and you can see a significant jump. So the teaching point is that not everything, like BUN not always comes from renal origin. It can be from different, different scenarios. So that's probably the five clinical scenarios that I would say. Okay, so very good. So, please answer the first question. Given the above information, how would you characterize this patient's kidney problem? So, I want you to go through the differential of pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. What, 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 what kind of scenarios can you think of in this patient? Um, I would think that it would be um, pre-renal. From what? Um, the splen uh, splenectomy. So, you think that he may have bled? that he bled and, and causing that is possible. Yeah, it's possible. You know, um, surgery, every time you hear surgery, you have to think about what, what else could go wrong in surgery. Bleeding, what else? Obstruction. obstruction. Mm -hmm. Like, and can you elaborate a little bit more? Like, obstruction, what type? Um, 
I'm sorry? If you right, if there is a, you know, we have, fortunately we have two uterus. Uh, to have this degree of creatinine, you, you kind of think like probably the, the, whatever is going on is happening in both kidneys, but you, you always have to think about like, like a surgical problem. But what else, what else is very common in the post-operative setting? What happens in the post-op setting? Related to obstruction. Uh -huh. That's also possible. It's less common, you know. Like, like if we were to talk about like common things being common, it's probably in the in the bottom, but it's possible, you know. But like, like what happens when you get surgery? Have you ever had surgery? Have you guys ever had surgery? Bowel movements and what else? And what else? No, like like severe constipation doesn't cause hydronephrosis. But what else happens? Have you ever had surgery? Has anybody anybody had surgery? Okay. Was it easy to pee after surgery? It's hard, right? Because we use anesthesia, we use opiates, and sometimes if they do a catheterization, probably this person had a catheter, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult to, to pee. So um, I remember when I had my appendectomy, <laughs> I was actually working here when, when, I, when I had my appendicitis. Remember, Dr. Benzer? <laughs> when I had my appendicitis. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got. I actually got more. I was ready to go home, and I couldn't pee. I had to stay like for for a little longer. But anyway, so always think about like when you have a patient after a procedure, you think about like difficulty voiding. How do you assess that in the hospital? How do you assess like if somebody is is they having difficulty voiding? Uh, but you have like a little pouch of the urine connected. Or, no. You mean if you have a foley? You mean? Yeah. Well, if you have a foley, you always need to make sure that they're able to void. How do you ensure that the patients are ready to go home? Like this is something that you always write when you're discharging a patient home. What do you tell the nurse to do? I'm sorry. No, but let's say let's say that you're discharging your patient home. You want to make sure that he's peeing, right? You always ask about are you pooping? Fine. I mean, pooping is not a big deal, probably for newborns, but but uh, for an adult, like like unless they're having abdominal pain or an abdom abdom ab abnormal abdominal exam, but for urination, it's always it's always required that you discharge the patient? Yeah, you take the folia. You take the folia and what do you tell the nurse? Measure. Measure how? They have to use one of those uh, canteen. I, I can't remember what they're called, but that's like urinals. urinals. Right, but what if you pee 50 cc's? That doesn't tell you if there's a lot of urine there, right? True. Uh, do you have to give them a certain amount of water and challenge it? I don't remember. But if your patient has CHF, you don't want to do that, right? Exactly. So it's a simple procedure, bedside, every floor in every hospital, decent hospital, will have a bladder scan and it's very easy to use. You just measure how much urine. You tell the patient, please void, mm -hmm. and I'm going to measure how much urine you have left. So technically, the textbook definition of, uh, uh, of um, significant is probably 200 ml. Like some, some nephrologists are more like 150 is, 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 is a lot. So if your patient voids and you measure and there's more than 200, that patient is still not ready. Or, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to keep them, but you need to bring the patient's attention. Um, and especially if the patient had a Foley catheter for a long time, you have to give them the chance that they're able to return to the normal, you know, functioning of the bladder. And uh, especially in the elderly, so if you have a female patient, there's only one problem, which is the, either the bladder got lazy from medications or neurogenic bladder or whatever, but if you have a male patient, in addition to the bladder, you have the prostate. And those patients can definitely, you know, in an 80-year-old male, that, that's something to entertain. Every time you get consulted for a patient with acute renal failure, elderly patient, a male with an intact prostate, you have to think about obstruction related to BPH. And let's say that you don't have a um, you don't have a bladder scan. How do you how do you make sure this patient is ready? Or how do you make sure if this patient is, is peeing? You mentioned like measuring the urine. So if you wanna rule out if you wanna rule out unfortunately the only way you need to you need to put a catheter. Mm -hmm. And then if you measure more than two hundred this patient is still retaining. Post void. Post void. Yeah. It's a problem because you want the patients out at eight o'clock in the morning. Right. <laughs> you want to discharge your patient, and this this is this is typical nursing duties. You know they know that they cannot send the patient out unless they're peeing. So make sure that you guys have that in mind when you're discharging patients home. So, but PVR. Nobody, no no single patient would like to be cat. I haven't met the first one that wants to be cat. One so of our patients actually, Richard. I won't mention. <laughs> <laughs> we get in common means. Um, 
transplant. He said, no problem. Transplant. Transplant is a big deal here, basically. And then he said, am I going to have a full transplant? And I said, yes. He said, I want the transplant. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big deal. People really, like, it's a big deal. usual GFR, you know? Uh, and I'm sorry, what's the urine, urine output? The 0.5, 0.5 kilogram per hour? 0.5 to 1 ml per kilogram yes, per hour. Yeah, that's the normal. Yeah, so, so if you're in the ER setting and a patient presents 80 year old urgent care setting, this is bread and butter. You guys are going to be frontline in the urgent care. Patient, elderly patient presents with um, difficulty urinating, you need to do a post void residual. So the way you write the order is assess post void residual. If urine, if, if PVR greater than 200, leave fully in place. That's how you write the order. Why? Because the nurse is going to go in, they're going to have the patient go, try to avoid. The patient are going to try whatever, you know, they can, they can pee nothing or they can pee a few cc's or they can pee a lot. After they put the Foley catheter, if you have a lot of urine, you need to leave that catheter there because that patient is not ready to go home without the catheter. And at that point, you need to call urology, you need to prescribe an alpha blocker, primarily, you know, I mean, probably Flomex over the other, the other old generation ones. And that patient needs to be seen at the urology clinic after one or two weeks of being on Flomax. That's when they do the voiding trial. And the urologist, what they do is they just take it out. They tell the patient just hang around like for about four hours and then come back. And that's how they make decisions about whether or not they, they, they can let the patient go. Or they need to put the Foley and they need to give him more time. And they add other medications like, you know, one of those testosterone uh, inhibitors, Proscar. Have you guys heard about Proscar? So that's the, the long-term management of VPH. Um, just uh, the alpha blocker relaxes the smooth, smooth muscle, whereas the Proscar is more like an inhibitor of like a, uh, like a, it's a testosterone analog, right? It just competes for the testosterone, I can't remember how it works. I think it competes for the testosterone receptor in the prostate, and, uh, but it doesn't have the anabolic effects of testosterone. So eventually that takes like six to 12 months to work and it, it shrinks the, the process. So that's the medical management of VPH. But the teaching point for you guys, a male patient, you have to rule out post-obstructive. In a post-operative setting, you need to rule out post-obstructive, okay? So very good. So what other differential can you think of? Let's say this guy had surgery. You mentioned something. You, you, both of you guys mentioned like, like surgical disasters, like they ligated the ureter or like the renal arteries, like they went down. So that's possible, but it's, it's very rare. So, but what else? What, what else is more common? What else? This question is open. Dehydration, yeah? So this guy was MPO. He went in for surgery. I didn't give you any historical information whether or not he's eating, but as a med student, your job is to get a good history about the intake of each patient and how many times, are, how many meals per day are you having in addition to are you having any GI losses, right? So this is bread and butter, like uh, history taking. Okay, dehydration is possible. Um, you know, and dehydration, is it reversible? Dehydration, when you, yeah, it's reversible. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna cover that later down the, down the road in the case. Okay, what else? Very good, very good. Very good, so actually the most common cause of like intraoperative um, acute kidney injury is hypotension, either from hypovolemia because they, they bleed and sometimes the reports are not accurate or because the blood pressure went down. And they've done studies, they actually they've looked into this and even in the absence of reported hypotension, patients can actually still have hypotensive induced kidney damage. And how do you call, how do you call the hypotensive induced kidney damage? Can you give a name and a last name to that kind of injury to the kidney? I'm sorry? Is it pre-renal pre azotemia is more like, like I'm getting dehydrated, I'm getting very, you know, very dehydrated, but if I don't, if I don't fix the dehydration, then I go to the next step, which is a more severe damage to the kidneys. How do you call that? How do you call that? Yeah, it's, it's ischemia of the kidneys. You, you just described it, it's ischemia of the kidneys. How do you? Mm, no, it's, it's one, of the, one of the end organ damage from hypovolemic shock. What is the most common cause of kidney damage? You guys know? Capillary What's that? Capillary you almost got it. <laughs> you, you almost got it. <laughs> so you guys remember on your boards, the Marty Brown, Marty Brown? 
ATN. So the take home message from this talk is the number one cause of kidney, uh, acute kidney injury is ATN. The second most common cause is ATN. The third most common cause is ATN. And the fourth more common cause is ATN. And then the rest below. So the chances of you having like a thrombosis of the renal arteries, it's probably the same chances of getting a shark attack in Santa Monica, <laughs> or maybe, or having an RPG um, in, the, in the hospital when you present it with a normal creatinine and you develop an RPG in. Again, it's possible, but like common things being common, we think about ATN. So that's the teaching point from, from, from this case. So, but ATN is just, uh, it's just like, the ultimate pathway to damage the kidneys. So your job as a doctor is to identify what caused the ATN. Because the kidney, like the same thing with the heart, like when Dr. Benzo gets a call about a patient with ongoing ischemia, it's very time sensitive. He needs to rush to the hospital, he needs to put a stent, or he needs to basically try to do everything possible to, to minimize the damage. Same thing with the kidneys. When you have a patient with ongoing damage, your job is to identify what's causing this. ATN is the ultimate type of damage, but there's many different types of processes that can cause ATN. Just to put it in perspective, it's like if you're presenting, I'm your attending, you're presenting like, this patient has a fever. Fever is just a sim symptom, but you're not giving me a diagnosis. So ATN is just like the, the ultimate lesion, like you describe it, is ischemia of the kidney, but what caused it? And this is what we're doing the exercise with this patient. Okay, so so we cover already uh, we cover already post obstructive we cover already intrinsic renal intrinsic disease of the kidney, um, which ATN is probably the most common one. Then we have the other ones. Do you guys remember what other diseases are associated with kidney damage? AIN. AIN. Okay, how common is AIN? It's actually, fortunately, it's not that common, but it's very, it's very common in your boards, by the way. <laughs> but it's not that common in clinical practice. But what's important is that you need to be able to recognize that AIN is happening. Because the treatment of AIN is? It's just to stop the drug that's causing it. And that's why it requires a lot of your clinical judgment. And that's why probably they test it so heavily in the boards, because they need, they need you to identify that some medications are notoriously associated with AIN. Do you guys remember which medications? Metformin. No, not metformin. No. NSAIDs. NSAIDs, very good. What else? Which one? Those are probably the biggest category. No, aminoglycoside is different. It's direct toxicity and ischemia, but not, not AIN. Penicillin. Penicillins, very good. Penicillins are actually the most notorious in the, in the, you know, in the category. Beta-lactam antibiotics. So they may give you on your boards, they may give you a, a case where a patient was treated for some, some sort of like infectious disease with a penicillin, and then he developed a rash and the patient didn't, didn't call the doctor or the doctor told him, don't worry, keep taking it. And uh, the next thing is that the kidneys, the, the patient presented with severe renal failure. So these patients may present with a rash, uh, typically in the lower extremities, but it can be generalized rash, it's a macular papular rash. These patients may present with peripheral eosinophilia and they may present with positive urine eosinophils. The positive urine eosinophils, you have to be very cautious about the interpretation because there are a lot of different kidney diseases that can actually give you positive urine eos. Like for instance, like, like a, an active glomerulonephritis can give you a positive urine eos. Or if you have a UTI, you can have positive urine eos. If you have prostatitis, you can have positive urine eos. So you have to really make the interpretation in the right clinical context. Uh, or for instance, if a patient has like, let's say if your patient has 100, 100 WBCs and you have only one urine eosinophil, that's actually pretty normal. But if your patient has 10 WBCs in the UA and you have five urine eosinophils, that's, that's actually concerning for the possibility of acute interstitial nephritis. So the management is identifying what's causing it, NSAIDs, beta-lactam antibiotics, and there is a big category that you may get tested, is the PPIs. Proton pump inhibitors are notorious for acute interstitial nephritis. 
So you may get that one on the boards because everybody knows about the penicillins. Is there any specific one? Because I'm always always putting them on the ICU and the prophylaxis. Uh-huh. Especially the double They can all cause... Yeah, omeprazole is probably the one that's being more reported because it's more used than, than the others. But they can all they can all cause uh, PPIs. You know what? What other um, clinical clinical problem is, is very common with chronic PPI use? You guys know, you know, and, and, and this is more like recently recognized in the last five years. Dementia. Which one? Dementia. Dementia is on the news. Yeah, CDF. dementia. CDF. Yeah, like like there were some some cases about like also osteoporosis. Now more recently it's associated with chronic kidney disease or progression of kidney disease without necessarily having the acute interstitial nephritis picture. But what's what's important is that if you have if you guys have refractory hypomagnesemia, that's actually PPI induced, and the treatment is to stop the PPI. And the reason why this is happening is because the PPI is not a renal wasting magnesium problem. It's actually a GI it blocks the, the, the transporter of magnesium in the gut. And it's, it's very interesting because I check magnesium in all, all my patients, when they come for follow-up, I always check magnesium. And I didn't know how clinically relevant this was until I started like, like checking magnesium routinely. And I've had patients showing up with magnesium of 0 0.7 with no, with no clear explanation. And they all, they all get better after you stop the PPI. You know, you replace the magnesium for some time, and you stop the PPI, and these patients get normal, normal, normal magnesium levels. It's important because if you have a patient like Dr. Benzer, the patient that he takes care of, like low magnesium, you know, guys, what, what happens with low magnesium? Torsades, right? So if a patient has a tendency to have arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, the worst thing you can have is low magnesium. That's the worst thing you can have because like, you can actually go into torsades. Yeah, so. It's, it's important that you, you, you have that in mind. So, you know, the more you do this, the more you realize like every medication is unique and every medication has side effects. So the way I see it is like, if you don't need it, don't do it. Some patients are very happy with medications. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that people want to take medication, but some patients they really feel, it's like a comfort thing. It's like, makes them feel better. Like they have more medication. So there's just something to think about. So PPIs, just to the take home message is PPI is, is one of the very common, commonly associated medications with AIN. Okay, very good. So AIN, if you, if you stop the medicine, most patients get better. If, if the patients don't get better and you, you, you still, you're thinking about giving steroids, then the next thing that you do is you do a biopsy of these patients. You just go in, you do a biopsy and you confirm the diagnosis and then you try to do like like a six week course of high dose prednisone and most patients do respond, but it all depends on how quickly you're able to recognize the problem. I had a lady who she presented, she was taking a PPI and the PPI was giving her the AIN. She went to the doctor and the doctor did a UA and the UA looked like a lot of WBCs because that's how the UA looks in AIN. So he treated her with, with Cipro. Cipro is another one that's notorious, by the way. Beta, beta lactams and fluoroquinolones are the two antibiotics that are associated. So he gave her a dose of, uh, he gave her a course of Cipro and the patient got admitted with a creatinine of seven. So when we look at the case, she was already developing the AIN for months, but it was very, it was not recognized because her creatinine was 0 0.6, then it went up to 0 0.8, then it went up to 1.0, and then it went up to 1.2. So doctors doesn't, they don't think like, oh, crying in 1.2 for a 70 year old woman is probably okay. Remember, it's not just the number, you need to look at the trends. That's the utility of always looking at the trends in creatinine or interpretation of acute kidney injury. Effectively, this woman doubled, her cranium went from 0.6 to 1.2, that's very abnormal. So you have to always interpret that in that, in that context. And the lady, she was on, she probably was on AIM probably for a good three months. And by the time I, I got involved in the case, we biopsy her, we confirmed the diagnosis, we stop everything, and she gradually recovered, but her new baseline creatinine was about 1.3. And, uh, which is fine, I mean, it's enough creatinine to have a normal life, but, but what I'm trying to say is that the prognosis depends on how quickly you pick up the, the diagnosis. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's very commonly tested on your boards. Okay, so what other diseases? Intrinsic, intrinsic diseases of the kidney. So we talk about ATN, we talk about AIN, we talk about GNs. GNs we're gonna, we're gonna cover in the next clinical case. Uh, but GN is a, is a whole, is a whole like compendium of nephrology. 
but we're going to talk about those. But it's very unlikely that you go in the hospital with a normal creatinine and then you develop a GIN in the hospital. But it, it's happened before. Okay, what else? What other diseases of the kidney? Polycystic kidneys, but typically we do, that's the reason why we do an ultrasound. But polycystic kidney is usually a very slow, progressive type of destruction of the renal parenchyma. Um, and most of the times these patients have a family history and, uh, and uh, the damage is usually picked up on a routine examination when they do a creatinine and the creatinine is abnormal the doctors order an ultrasound and they see like this cyst uh, typically these kidneys are enlarged and that's why um, these patients develop compression symptoms that's actually the most common complaint the cyst can actually cause bleeding they can cause pain they can cause hematuria they can increase your risk of having uh, pyelonephritis uh, like an infected, like a complicated cyst getting an infection and it can in slightly increase your, your risk of developing renal cell carcinoma. So the kidneys, these patients, I don't know if you've ever seen a patient with polycystic kidneys, the kidney can actually double the normal size which is 10 to 12 centimeters. These patients with polycystic kidneys they can present with like 20, 22, 23 and when they're very thin females you can actually feel the kidneys. You can actually feel when they you know like all the way up to they compress it into the spleen or they compress it into the liver. Some of these patients can have actually enlargement of both the kidneys and the liver. And one interesting thing about these patients when they present with polycystic kidneys and polycystic liver is that the kidneys, the cysts, the, the, the cysts are associated with destruction of the parenchyma and ultimately these patients need dialysis or transplant. But with liver patients, they don't this, this cyst doesn't really destroy the liver parenchyma, but what, they, what it causes is like the liver is massive. I don't know if you've seen pictures of like a polycystic liver, it, and that's an indication to get a liver transplant, just because they, the patients, they start getting malnourished. They can't eat. They cannot eat anything. I had a patient the other day at UCLA. The guy ended up getting combined liver kidneys. Um, the kidneys, he was not, he wasn't still on, on dialysis category, but he got the, the, the kidney because he was going to need a renal transplant at one point. And the liver, the synthetic function of the liver was normal. Actually, I was impressed when I looked, reviewed the labs, the albumin was fine, the INR was fine, the PT, PTT was fine, but it was just the fact that he couldn't eat. The, the liver was so massive. So, and sometimes they just do a hepatectomy, but ultimately these patients are going to require liver transplant. So, but yeah, on your boards, they may give you the, that type of um, uh, scenario. And what, what other disease associations are associated with polycystic kidneys? So, sorry, polycystic kidneys, mm -hmm. autosomal dominant. Autosomal dominant, yeah. It's an autosomal dominant.